Lighthouse Baptist Church family. It's Brother Darren coming to you live. We're glad that you are watching with us. We want to give you an update what's going on uh, with our church. And, uh, you know, during this whole COVID uh, phenomenon the last two months, uh, we have had to be flexible and we've had to uh, await and see what each new day brought, each new week brought. And so I just want to say this is an important week in the life of our graduates. We're looking forward to this Sunday. Uh, you don't want to miss this Sunday. Uh, and I'll talk to you more about that in just a moment. I wanted to share with you, I don't know if you keep a spiritual journal, but since I was 19 at Southwest Baptist University, uh, my professor of discipleship, Dr. Bernard Holmes, encouraged us to keep a spiritual journal. So the, the break between Christmas and New Year's has been my practice to always go out and find a journal. Uh, I started with a little spiral bound. Now I've upgraded. Uh, this last year I went and found one uh, that was a slip cover, and I found some leather, and I just bound it myself. But I record in it thoughts, prayers, sermons, uh, important people in my life, as you can see here. Uh, this last week, as we were praying and thinking about what we were going to do as far as this next week and opening up our church for a soft opening, uh, our, our plans had been to open on May 24th, but since uh, different things have come down the pike and I think a lot of people are itching to get back to church, we're going to try a soft opening this week. So I was praying about that, and I was thinking about how important it is, especially for our graduating seniors. You know, this class of 2020 is, man, they've been through so much. I was reading an article, and I'm going to use it uh, in my sermon this Sunday, about a young lady. And she wrote to the magazine, and she said, you know, I didn't realize that when we took off for spring break, it was going to be my last time to be at my school, to be in my classroom, uh, to be with my study group. I didn't realize that we wouldn't get back together as a group of students. And she talked about how hard it was not to be down, uh, but to be positive and to be focused. She talked about some of the losses that she's experienced emotionally and socially. Yes, she said she's connected you know, with her friends uh, through all the social media and texting. But she said, you know, to be with your friends, to be able to go out. She said she was so looking forward uh, to the whole lead up to prom and buying a dress and fixing her hair and makeup and getting with her girlfriends. She was looking forward to other social gatherings. She was looking forward to her spring sports and all that got canceled. This generation, I'm going to preach on this Sunday, but this generation, this class of 2020, who was born in the shadow of 9-11. You remember September uh, 11th, 2001? This class are the kids that were born in the shadow of that history-changing event. They've never known a world where terrorism wasn't spoken of at least uh, once a week in some type of uh, media and some type of uh, event that took place. They've never known what it was like to go to the airport and not have to wait in line and be triple checked before you can board a plane. They've no, never known a world uh, where it wasn't like that. These kids have, uh, well, these young adults now, they've had to come through so much, and they are very resilient. And I want to preach this Sunday a message to them and to our whole church about how this is a resilient generation, much like the generation of the Jews who were captured by Nebuchadnezzar uh, in Babylon when they came and they snatched up and they kidnapped the nobles' children and the political leaders' children in Israel and carried them off to Babylon. And I was praying about our kids. And I was thinking, well, what does resilient mean? Uh, you know, these young people are going to have to be resilient. I mean, they're having to make uh, decisions right now. I mean, some have lost their jobs because they work for restaurants. They've lost, uh, some of them are th rethinking college. Is college worth it? Uh, is the degree that I was going to go after, you know, is there any future for uh, making a career and making money and be able to pay back student loans. Uh, maybe I need to change my mind. And I just want to encourage our young people. Resilience is the ability to get through, to get over, and to thrive after a trauma, a trial, or a tribulation. It's a skill. It's a talent. It's a way of life. And the, these young people, uh, well, all God's people are going to have to be resilient in the days, weeks, and months to come. And I hope that we can be encouraged. And I was just thinking about people in the Bible that are resilient. You know, uh, we talked about uh, Mother's Day. Uh, 
talk about Hagar, but I, I really wanted to talk about Jochebed, Moses' mother, how resilient she was. I was thinking about Joseph, uh, who's, who was uh, you know, sold out by his brothers, and they wanted to kill him. They sold him into slavery, but how resilient Joseph was. I was thinking about Esther, and young ladies who are graduating, our, our, our girls uh, and college students, man, Esther's such a great character study of a woman that God raised up to speak to the most powerful person in the Persian Empire, her husband, and to intercede on behalf of her people that Haman, wicked Haman might not wipe out the entire Jewish people. And God placed her at the right time, at the right place, by his providence for such a time as this. And I'm praying that God will use some of you in such a time as this in your generation. I was thinking about Daniel. I'm going to preach on Daniel uh, this Sunday and how God displayed his glory even through uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and David as they were kidnapped and ripped up from their homes, their culture, their families, their communities, and transplanted into Babylon. I was thinking about Caleb and Joshua. I was thinking about so many different characters in the Scripture. And one thing they all had in common, and that is all these biblical persons, they looked to God and they knew God was in control in the midst of their trials and their traumas. So I just want to remind you, whether you're, you're at home, uh, whether you've been released to go back to work, uh, whether you're going to attempt to come to church this Sunday, I always want us to be reminded um, that we may not always understand the why, but we always need to ask God what now. I hope that you come prepared for worship this Sunday, and I'm going to talk to you more about that in just a moment. Hey, I want to share a verse of scripture uh, with you all today. It's 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. That's what the Apostle Paul said. Uh, to his protege, uh, his disciple that he had been uh, a mentor to, young Timothy, who had taken over the role of pastor of the church there in Ephesus. This is what he said in 1 Timothy 6, 11. He said, but you, man of God, flee from these things and pursue righteousness, pursue godliness, pursue faith, pursue love, pursue endurance and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Dear friends, I just want to remind you, this life is going to have lots of up and downs. It's going to seem uh, at times like there are more downs than there are ups. But I want to encourage all of us today with these words uh, that the Apostle uh, Paul gave to his son in the faith, uh, Timothy, and to remind you and to remind me that to be a person of God, to be a man of God or a woman of God, we got to flee from the things that distract us. we got to flee from the things that would take our eyes off of God. We got to flee from the things that would cause us uh, to have to quit the race or be disqualified from the race of our Christian faith. What we need to pursue is righteousness. We need to pursue the things that are right that God says is right. We need to pursue godliness. And I just want to be uh, honest with you. When God says to us that we need to pursue righteousness, that means we have to work at it. We have to train for it. The word for uh, that we use for gymnasium comes from the idea that Paul used with Timothy that you have to work out your faith. Just like an Olympic athlete, he trains or she trains uh, for the Olympic Games. I'm talking years of hard, arduous training, both in what they eat, in their exercise, in their skill set, and then in the actual event that they're running. And he says you have to pursue godliness. He says you got to pursue faith. I just want to encourage you, sometimes it's a fight to have faith. That's why you need to be in the Word of God. That's why you need to pray and say, Holy Spirit of God, uh, convict me and convince me that God's Word is true and wash yourself in the water of the Word every day. He says to pursue love. Love is something that God has to cause us to show to one another. And that's why when the love of Jesus fills your heart, you have to constantly be reminded that because Jesus loves you, you can love others. So pursue love. And then the idea of endurance. We have to remind ourselves and each other, our families, our friends, our co-workers, uh, even your Sunday school teacher, even as deacons, as deacon wives, as staff members, and as a pastor, I need to be reminded this is not a sprint. This Christian life that we have been so graciously uh, benefited from, that God's called us into his glorious kingdom, this Christian life, well, it calls for endurance. we got to run and not give up. If we stumble and fall, get back up. Brush yourself. Don't quit. It calls for endurance because it's not a sprint. We need gentleness. i got to work on that. Uh, a lot of you 
know that uh, not everyone's got the spirit of gentleness, and that's something that God gives us, gentleness. But then he says to fight the good fight of faith. You know, we got to be the complete package. Yes, we got to be firm and gentle, and that's what it that's what it means to grow up into maturity. Uh, you know, that's one of the things that I love about some of our seasoned senior adults is they have lived long enough to know that you know things that they used to think were worth fighting for aren't, but things that they didn't used to think were worth fighting for are. And so we got to be gentle, but we got to realize we got to fight the good fight of faith. Now, with that being said, I got up Saturday morning, and on Twitter I saw that a guy was just a couple years younger than me. He actually uh, planted quite the church in St. Louis. We went to the same college in Bolivar, Missouri, at Southwest Baptist University. His name was Darren Patrick. Uh, I think I may have met him at SBU in an event one time, but he really, you know, he was dissatisfied with the denomination, the bureaucracy, all He went and planted a new church that just exploded and grew in St. Louis, and he started the Acts 29 Network, planted, I don't know, maybe four or five churches there in the St. Louis greater area. And then he ran into some difficulties with uh, his staff and had some accusations made, and so he stepped down from that ministry. And his life ended Saturday or Friday. Uh, he went out shooting with a buddy. Don't know exactly what happened, but all we know is, is that um, he, he's gone. They said it was a self-inflicted wound. They said that there was no foul play. And he leaves behind uh, a beautiful wife and four kids. He was in the ministry. He'd gone through discouragement. He'd gone through defeat. Um, some rightful uh, accusations that he repented of and made public acknowledgement of, other things that he uh, was falsely accused of. But that being said, it just reminded me that, you know, ministry in church is important, and ministry in church takes effort, and ministry requires uh, gentleness, love, and forgiveness. His self-inflicted gunshot wound while target shooting uh, is very sad. He's made such a splash and such a leadership impact in his books that he's written, uh, in the conferences that he's led, um, but he's gone. And it reminds me that we need to pray for people. We need to pray for people in leadership. We need to pray for our national leaders, our denominational leaders. We need to pray for your uh, church leaders, for your Sunday school class uh, teacher. And we need people to step up and lead. And if you're going to lead, that makes you an easy target for criticism and accusations. But I want to read you uh, something that he wrote after he graduated from SBU and his wife, Amy, and his three daughters, uh, Glory, Grace, Delaney, and his son, Drew, he said he, with his son, he had a prayer for his son when his son turned uh, six or seven years old. Listen to this prayer. He prayed this for his son, Drew. He said, God, make me a man with thick skin and a soft heart. Make me a man who's tough and tender. Make me tough so I can handle life. Make me tender so I can love people. God, make me a man. And dear friends, I just want to say that spoke to me. I've been thinking about that this week. I hope and pray that you want to be a man of God. You want to be a woman of God. We do need to be uh, thick-skinned and tender-hearted. We really do. And we need to be mindful of those who are hurting around us. We need to be mindful of those who are doing their best to make decisions in a very fluid situation and circumstance, whether that be in business, whether that be here at the church, whether that be in our nation. And so I just want to caution you and I just want to encourage you, uh, be quick to listen, slow to speak, uh, pray for the Holy Spirit of God to grant you wisdom and guidance, and be the best version of yourself that God would want you to be. And let's be mindful and thankful for those who have been godly influences in our life. Maybe, maybe you need to take a moment Write an email, send a text, write a note, and send it to somebody who's been a godly influence in your life, who's helped you, who's encouraged you, that's challenged you. But let's not forget those who God's placed in leadership that's helped us. So I hope that encourages you. I want to thank all of you who are leaders, all of you who have stepped up and reached out and made sure that our ministry continues as we care and minister to those who are hurting, uh, those who are enduring sickness and even uh, cancer treatments, those who have recently lost loved ones. Our heart goes out to you. We pray that the Holy Spirit of God continue to comfort you. That you draw, draw strength from God's word and from God's spirit and his people. So I'm so excited uh, to share with you our plan to reopen 
And so I'm going to share that with you in just a minute. Church family, I'm so excited to share with you this plan that we put together as a staff and as deacons. And this is going to be posted on Facebook and on the webpage here just in a few moments. But I want to share with you uh, our Red House Baptist Church regathering plan. We're excited to get back together. Our plan moving forward tentatively uh, looks like the following. And again, everything's fluid. Currently, and I hope you like the little uh, imagery here of a stoplight. We got a stoplight, red, everything, everything's been stopped for the last two months. And then yellow is caution. That's going to be phase one, what we're going to enter into here uh, this week and next. And then maybe, maybe mid-June we'll enter into the green, the phase two. But all this is up to uh, uh, change because things could change quickly, as you know. So currently, we've been gathering online. Currently, our services for children, students, and adults have been available online. And I just want to say thank you to my staff. Uh, the staff, I should say your staff, your staff here at Red House Baptist Church has done a phenomenal job. Even Shama, who's trying very hard not to make me laugh right behind the camera right now, has done a fantastic job with our online content and helping us. Uh, but I just want to say thank you to Dwayne. Uh, doing a great job with our students, Miss Linda and her workers, done a great job with the children. And I just want to thank our ladies in the office. Uh, we've scaled down to a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday uh, office work week, and they've adjusted and done great. Uh, obviously, the Family Life Center has been closed. It's been amazing, as uh, Donna shared with me, how the online giving has started down here. Just a few people were giving online, and it's gradually crept up, up, and up, and now it's kind of plateaued, but a lot more people are giving online. And may I say, thank you. It's amazing that we're making budget, and I just want to say that is such a blessing. And your generosity to give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering in support of home missions, what a blessing. Thank you uh, for being stout in your giving. And it's just been wonderful. So continue to give online. Uh, some of you have come by the office and you dropped it off. That's a, That's been appreciated. But now we're going to enter into phase one, which is the yellow. It's going to be the caution phase. And what we're going to do, now this is a soft opening starting this Sunday. Uh, we're going to try to do a soft opening. What does that mean? Well, that means we're going to continue to offer online service. We're going to live stream the worship service. Uh, we have come up with a plan, which there's just three entrances. The two entrances off the foyer over my left shoulder, uh, where a lot of people come in by the church office. And then on the other side of the foyer, where our handicapped folks come in, those two doors are going to be open. Uh, and then the door at the end of the FLC hallway is going to be open. And you're going to see the cone set up, and you're going to see the tape's been stretched out. And we're going to ask people to enter by one door and come straight into the sanctuary and exit uh, by another door. Uh, leading out of the building. So that's the plan for this Sunday. We're going to meet at 1045. Now, because we're going to socially distance, we're going to try to apply uh, a checkerboard mentality. Now, this is going to be online for you to see. It's going to be in the bulletin. But just imagine a checkerboard. And so every other seat and every other row, just six feet apart, sit as a family unit, however you come to church. So if you come in a car load, or if you, as a family, come in a van, however you come, but it's a family unit uh, so that we don't have people from different households sitting together. So I just encourage you to sit in the sanctuary uh, in a checkerboard manner. We'll have ushers and deacons available if you have any questions, and we're going to do our best to, we don't know what it's going to look like. Uh, you know, we're, our goal is 33% of the facility can be you can be uh, uh, filled up into the sanctuary. So we're going to have an overflow in the gym. So if it feels like we're approaching, um, you know, a, a saturation point in the sanctuary where we can safely worship together and sit together at six feet apart uh, as uh, a family, then we're going to ask those other folks to uh, sit in the gym. And again, this is all trial and error. So bear with us the next couple of weeks as we get a better feel on who all is coming. Uh, we encourage those who have a compromised immune system uh, to just worship from home like you have been. Obviously, we want you to continue to meet your Sunday school classes as you have been online or by telephone. And so we're going we're gonna to ask you to help us. We're going to ask you to help us to enforce uh, the six-foot distancing. Uh, we're 
We're not going to pass an offering plate. We're going to ask that you use the little red red house church that we're going to set out in the foyer to drop your offerings there if you're not giving online. We're going to ask uh, we're going to ask that if you need a mass that you let the ushers uh, know when you come in the building. We have uh, between two and three hundred available. They're not for you to take. They're for one per person to use if you need it. Otherwise, we encourage you to please uh, bring your mask at home, the mask that you use. If you go out to the stores, just bring that, wear that when you enter into the building. It's not mandatory, but it's strongly encouraged. Um, no communal food or beverages. We're going to, please, uh, we, I'm just asking you, don't, no food and beverages, leave those in the car. Um, sit with your household, with, with your family that you came with, okay, that you're in the home with, that you're fellowshipping with. We just encourage you to help us to do that. We ask you you be aware of the fact that there's no child care provided. Uh, and please, obviously, we want to practice good hygiene, uh, hand washing, um, and sanitize. Bring your own. We're going to have some here. It's difficult for us to get masks, so we have some. But if you have your own, bring it. But most of all, we want you to bring a welcoming spirit, and we want you to bring enthusiastic worship. One of the things that's been heavy in my heart for the last week, 10 days, is to remember as God's under shepherd for you as a church, as your pastor, that our primary responsibility as people, even more importantly than health and safety, our primary responsibility is to worship the one true God. Please bring a spirit of worship. Bring a spirit of joy. Love on God. Express your love and your gratefulness to God. Express humility to God and exalt the greatness of our God. So bring a right attitude and bring some energy in our enthusiastic worship. Yes, we're going to ask that uh, I'm going to, uh, listen, I'm going to try to sing. Believe it or not, I'm going to try and sing out, but I'm going to do it with my mask on. And so obviously those who are on the platform lead worship aren't. Those of us in the congregation can, and it's not mandatory, but it is strongly encouraged. Now, what about phase two in the green, the green part here? Well, all this is just a sketch of what we hope. Uh, we hope to include online services. We hope to include possibly, and, and this is going to be up to you. Now, if the majority of you out there decide to come and say, we want to get back in the Sunday school, we want to come. If we're running 350 uh, to 400 people, what we're going to have to do is go back to two services. And we're going to try to do that by Sunday school classes. So remember, years ago, what we did was we had Sunday school classes decide how we're going to do this. Now, it's going to look different now because we need to keep the families together, at least until uh, the governor and daycares and others say it's okay for children to not be in the family unit with their parents. But the problem with little kids, it's hard to keep a two or three or four year old, it's, it's hard to keep them, you know, from social distancing and loving and touching and hitting other people. So all this is, uh, like I said, fluid and we're hoping that in the middle or end of June we can come back and that our numbers will, will help us to know whether or not we can go to a flip-flop service or one group's meet in the worship center, another group's meeting in Sunday school, and then we'll flip-flop. The others will go to worship, the others will go to Sunday school. Again, all this is in preparation, and it's in the pipeline to see if we can do this. Now, we're going to have to continue to abide by certain common sense things, like no communal food. Listen, it kills me as a Baptist to, not, to think that we're not going to be able to have some of the best cooking in Madison County when we come together. Hopefully we will by the end of summer or the fall, but for the near future, uh, no communal food or beverages. Again, we're hoping and planning and praying that we'll be able to uh, rejoin one another in Sunday school in small groups. But until we know for sure, this is just a plan for a phase two opening. And we want to be flexible. Our target date is Father's Day, uh, June 21st. But again, everything's flexible, but that's our target date. In addition, preschool, child care, ETC, all this is to be determined. All ministries and in-person gatherings um, will need to be making preparations in order to ensure the safety of everyone. I love what Brother Dwayne said. He said, maybe, maybe we can start some youth events outside, social distancing, do some things outside. That may work for some Sunday school classes. You know, you sit six feet apart or you come out and enjoy the warm weather. We got lots of room. I mean, we got 12 acres. We got 10 to 12 acres here. But I'm just saying we need to be flexible. We need to be creative. 
uh, we need to be concerned about uh, uh, the safety and welfare of others, but we really want to worship God. That's what we want to do. We want to come together and worship him. Do you know that the very next Sunday after this Sunday, I believe it's the May 31st, you know that's Pentecost, 50 days after Easter. It's the day that the Jews celebrate when God gave Moses the Torah on Mount Sinai, gave him the covenants. When we became the people of God, we're organized as the people of God, commissioned as the people of God, and it was also the day in which uh, the Jews celebrate the giving of the Torah. And that's the same day God gave the letter of the law. He gave the spirit of the letter of the law, the Holy Spirit, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and filled all the believers. That's amazing. So we won't be full throttle back, if we can, uh, May 31st, and celebrate uh, Pentecost and let the Holy Spirit of God rush in like a mighty wind. And so I hope that you come. I hope that you're looking forward to it. And again, we just want to worship the Lord. We want to enjoy the fellowship. And I just pray that God will bless you. And I hope to see you this Sunday, but definitely the Sunday after. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.